Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Aditya, and I'm doing my final year engineering in Chennai. Um, though I'm a Hindu, I have been having this uh, question about Islam that I wanted to ask, and no better a person than Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, as you said in your speak many times, the Holy Quran was written 1400 years ago and is considered the most worthy and the latest revelation given by Allah. So I have two questions to you. Allah, who knows all, why didn't he give his best of revelation the first time itself to the first of messengers? And why did God take so many times to give his best of knowledge? And my second question, which is related to this, is even before the Holy Quran was written, that is 1400 years ago, human beings had lived in the earth for thousands of years. So why did Allah, the most merciful, didn't give them that best knowledge which he has given us for the last 1400 years? Thank you. The brother asked a very good question, very relevant question. Two questions, both the questions overlapping the answers. He said that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give this last and final revelation 1400 years ago? Why not in day one when you meet me for there? And second part, which is a part of the same question, that what about the people who lived before 14 years ago? They were deprived of the Quran. So if Allah is most merciful, most gracious, most beneficent, so isn't it that the people earlier before 14 years were deprived? Very good question. To reply to your question, my son, he tells me that, Abba, father, you want me to become a doctor? Why do you want me nursery, first standard, second standard, then school, then college. Why don't you put me into medical college directly? If I want my son to become a medical doctor, I don't have to put him into the medical college directly. I have to first make the grounds very clear. First he goes into the pre-primary school, then goes into the school, first standard onwards on passes school, then goes to the higher school, then college, and when he's fit, then he enters the medical college. Similarly, Almighty God, who has knowledge of the unseen, has knowledge of everything, he even has knowledge of the human beings. So, it is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 38, Allah says, that we have sent a revelation in every age, in every period. By name, four are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. But there were several revelations sent. The first revelation, Almighty God, knew that the human beings had to develop. If he would have revealed the Quran at the first time, at the time of Adam, peace be upon him, he knew the human beings won't be able to grasp it. That's the reason in the revelation that came before the Quran, that's the Injil. Today we have the Bible, though we don't consider the Bible to be the Injil, but some parts of the Bible may be the word of God. It's mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of John. Chapter number 16, verse number 20 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall show you the way to come. He shall glorify me. So here, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he knew, but yet he said that you will not be able to grasp it. Therefore, when the last and final messenger will come, he will show you things to come. So similarly, Almighty God, he knew very well that when is the right time, for the human beings to receive the last and final revelation of the Quran, and that was about 1400 years ago. As far as the second part of the question is concerned, what about the people that came before the Quran was revealed? I will tell them that if my son goes to standard one, he will not be given the medical question paper. He'll be given the question paper of standard one. If he goes to higher school, he'll be given the question of higher school, then junior college, fine? So similarly, the basic message of Almighty God in all the scriptures, in all the revelations, from the first revelation till the last revelation, Quran was the same, that you have to believe in one God, that you have to worship him and no one else. So all the messengers, right from the first messenger, Adam, peace be upon him, right down to Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, all of them taught the basic message of oneness of God and about Tawheed. And about this message, of oneness of God and Tawheed, inshallah, I'll be discussing in detail on the last day of this conference, on the last Sunday, that the 20th of January, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you for the question. Do we have another question?
from a guest here, non-Muslim. Okay, we'll go to the gentleman section, rear microphone. Gentlemen, could you please state your name and your occupation, please? Good evening, everyone. My name is Sanjeev. Um, I'm working here in Land Marvel Company as an admin executive. Uh, I got a few questions, but I'll ask only two questions uh, regarding this uh, Islam. First question is, uh, uh, do Islam believe in rebirth? Uh, and second question is, in Islam, it's not allowed to commit suicide. But many people that in Pakistan, in Arabic countries, they are uh, blowing themselves up and they are killing many people. So who, they, who are the people they are motivating them, whether they are fall, really following the Islam or who is motivating them? That is my question, sir. The brother has two questions. The first question, does Islam believe in rebirth? And the second question, that is suicide prohibited in Islam? How come people in Pakistan, other part of the world, they're blowing up themselves and killing themselves, the two questions. As far as the first question is concerned, that does Islam believe in rebirth? If you ask only in rebirth, yes, Islam believes in rebirth. What we believe? That a human being has come to this world once, the Quran says that we give you life and come on this earth. Then we cause you to die and then we resurrect you again in the next life. This is exactly what is mentioned in the Vedas. If you read Rig Ved, book number 10, it speaks about Punar Janam. Punar means next, Janam means life. So the Ved speaks about Punar Janam, about the next life. But unfortunately, most of the Hindus, they misunderstand the meaning of Punar Janam. Punar means next, Janam means life. We believe in the next life. You say Punar Janam, you say rebirth, we have no problem. But most of the Hindus, they believe in a philosophy known as samsara. It's a Sanskrit word, samsara, which means birth, death, birth, death. A cycle of reincarnation, a cycle of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. This cycle of birth, death, birth, death, or samsara, or reincarnation, is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. What they quote is a verse of Bhagavad Gita, Chapter number two, verse number 22, which says that like a human being takes off the old clothes and puts on new clothes, same way the soul throws away the old body and puts on the new body. As far as this is concerned, I've got no objection with the Bhagavad Gita. It's further mentioned even in the Upanishads that like a caterpillar walks up a grass of blade, it jumps onto the new grass, I've got no problem. Now, as far as the scriptures are concerned, if you take the literal meaning of the Ved, which does not speak about the cycle of birth, death, birth, death, but only speaks about Punar Janam, next life, Islam speaks the same. But most of the scholars of Hinduism, they could not understand that how can a human being be born with some congenital defect? How can he be born as a handicap? Some are born healthy, some are born handicapped, some are born in rich family, some are born in poor family. So they thought this was injustice. So how could God be unjust? Therefore they propounded the theory of samsara, which is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. The Vedas are considered as the highest Hindu scriptures. In the Hindu scriptures, we have the Smriti and you have the Shruti. Smriti means scripture written by the human beings. And Shruti are the Vedas and Upanishads considered to be the word of God. Now, because they could not justify why some people are born in rich family, some in poor family, some are born healthy, some with congenital defect, they propounded this theory of samsara. As far as Islam is concerned, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah zi khalakal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life you're leading is a test for the hereafter. And we believe that every child is born sinless, is born masoom. Irrespective whether he's born handicapped or healthy, whether rich family, poor family, all these things are a test for the human beings. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, and Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, He says that surely we will test you with fear and hunger. 
with loss of life and loss of what you have earned. It's mentioned in Surah Anfal chapter number 8, verse number 28, that your children and your wife are a test for you. Now here we realize that the Quran says your children are a test for you. Now if a child, suppose, is born handicapped, it's a test for the parents. The parents may be very good, they may be pious, Maybe Allah wants to test them more. After giving them a child which is handicapped, yet do they have faith in Allah or not? It's a test. So whenever any calamity befalls any human being, it's either a punishment or a test. Whenever any good thing happens in your life, it's either a reward or it's a test. That does not mean if something bad happens, it has to be a punishment. It can be a punishment, it can be a test. If something good happens in your life, it can be a reward or it can be a test. So here, Almighty God is testing the parents that do they have faith in Almighty God? So if a handicapped child is born, the parent may be an average Muslim and if he says, oh, why? My child only has to be born handicapped. Why my child has to be born with a congenital heart disease? Allah is testing them. The people who are good Muslims, they'll say, Allah has destined, no problem yet. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more difficult the test, more higher is the reward. To pass a simple graduation of BA is easy. But to pass MBBS is difficult. The moment you pass MBBS in front of a name, you get doctor, DR full stop. Higher status. Examination is difficult, the honor is more. So Almighty God tests different people different way. The child that is born, what the Hindus said, the Hindu scholars, in his previous janam, in his previous birth, he did a sin, therefore he was born handicapped. They didn't have any other justification. If you do good deeds, then you are born healthy. So what the Hindu scholars, they propounded, that every living creature, it keeps on changing. According to them, the universal brotherhood in Hinduism is, all living creatures are your brothers. So sometimes you are born as an animal, sometimes as a bird, sometimes as a rat, sometimes as a cockroach, sometimes as a human being. And the human being is the highest level. And you're born as a human being seven times. So they came with this philosophy because they could not justify why a child is born rich or poor, handicapped or healthy. Similarly, for a person who's born poor, it's a test for him. For the rich people, he has to give zakat. Every rich person who has a saving of more than a Nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. For the poor person, for him, he gets full marks in zakat. He's poor, so he has to give no zakat, 100 out of 100. But we say, Are garib admi, poor man. Poor man. Poor man, he's got 100 out of 100 in zakat. The rich man, if he gives proper zakat, he may get 100 out of 100. He says, okay, fine, I've got so much wealth. This part is exempted from zakat. He may give 50% of zakat. So he'll get negative points. He may not give zakat at all. So imagine, suppose there's a questioner there's a question in a question paper which is very easy. Should you be happy or sad? So when a person is born poor, actually in zakat, he gets 100 out of 100. Therefore, beloved prophet said, it's easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. But we say, Are a poor man. How sad. Not sad. 100 out of 100 in zakat. My beloved brothers and sisters, this man asked Dr. Zakir Nai a question about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran so late, why he didn't give it to the first prophet or to the first humanity. And Alhamdulillah, Dr. Zakir Naik has given the answer eloquently and he made him understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be the bearer of the Quran. And when this non-Muslim man, they ask you a question, try to answer them, try to clarify their misconceptions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you abundantly and show them the best character and conduct. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as a mercy to the whole world. So as an ummah, as a follower of Prophet Muhammad, we should be nice to people, we should be kind to people, we should be merciful towards others. Because the non-Muslims, they are not seeing Islam, they are seeing you as a human being. You are the 
ambassadors of Islam. So have the best character and conduct. So they will be interested in Islam by seeing you. And always give da'wah to people. Spread Islam across the globe. Share this beautiful message of Islam with each and every one. Whenever anyone accepts Islam through your da'wah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you immensely. Allah says in the Quran, Udu'u ila sabili rabbik bil hikmati wal mawhizatil hasana. Call people to the path of Allah with wisdom and with beautiful teachings. And we are just a reminder. We should remind and reminder benefits the believers. Reminder benefits people. Allah is the one who will guide. But our duty is to transmit the message. May Allah make it easy for us.